and living in Colorado, teaching philosophy, religious studies, and women and gender studies. She has two bachelor arts, deg arts degrees from Hendricks College, a master of arts in religious studies from the University of Colorado Boulder, and a PhD in religious studies through the doctoral program offered jointly through the Islip School of Theology and the University of Denver. Her doctoral work focused on American white supremacy as a manifestation of religion and violence in the modern world. Her first book, Strip, The Making of a Fem Feminist, can be found anywhere books are sold. And you can find her at Catlin, C-A-T-L-Y-N, Keenan, K-W-N-A-N dot com. My name is the Reverend Alan Cole. I am the rector at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Lakewood. Tonight for our conversation, if you have questions as we progress, feel free to type them in the chat. And our producer, Michelle Auerbach-Cole, will give those to Catlin and to me. Welcome, Catlin. Thank you so much for having me. Glad you could join us. Uh, tell us, how did you get interested in white supremacy and how did you end up writing your dissertation on it? Uh, yeah, so um, I really inherited this interest um, from my parents. Both of my parents uh, were born and raised, my entire extended family is from Southern Mississippi. My dad was in college when James Meredith in, uh, integrated um, the colleges in Mississippi. And the other really important thing that impacted me as a young person is that my father is from Philadelphia, Mississippi, which those of you who know anything about the civil rights movement or who were alive at the time may remember that three civil rights workers, two of whom were white, were killed by the KKK in Philadelphia, Mississippi and buried in a dam in 1964. And my dad was a young man living in Philadelphia when that happened. And Philadelphia is a little tiny town. It's, it's a small town. And he says that everyone who lived in Philadelphia uh, knew who did it. Mm -hmm. And so when I was, oh, I don't know, I was like 12 or 13 years old, my father's family gathered at my uncle's house in Philadelphia, Mississippi to watch the film Mississippi Burning, which is about that incident. And my father's family is a super boisterous, loud family. And I remember when, that, when we were watching that movie, it was completely silent. And after the movie was over, there was just like this pause. And then the entire family started talking because they knew everyone featured in the film. And I suddenly realized that my family had this legacy, this weird connection to something that was really historically significant and super violent. Um, and that was my first sort of moment of awareness that there was this aspect to my life that I hadn't really known about. And then when I was in high school in Harrison, Arkansas, I went to high school with the son of the Grand Dragon of the KKK. He was a year ahead of me. And Harrison was an entirely white town. And my junior year, I think, a black family moved into town. Everyone knew about it. And when the daughter of the black family showed up for her first day of middle school, this would have been in the early 90s, the KKK met her in full regalia at the doors of the middle school no police were called. <laughs> they were probably in the robes. <laughs> and so, um, and that was sort of my second moment. But you know, I went on and started graduate school and whatever. And I was in my PhD program at DU and I took a class that was sort of on new religious movements. And I started getting really interested in the intersections between religion and violence. And for that class, I started researching like, who am I gonna write my big term paper on? And I came across this group um, of white supremacists. They're called Christian identity. There are sort of different ways of categorizing white supremacists. So there's the KKK, which are Protestant Christian. Then there's sort of the neo-Nazi skinheads and they are typically not Christian. And then there's Christian identity, which is its own very specific interpretation of Christianity. And so I ended up writing my term paper on them and at the time, the most active white uh, Christian identity church in the United States was in Laporte, Colorado, right outside Fort Collins. So it's like right in our backyard. 
And so I got super interested and I thought about how this particular version of Christianity is explicitly violent and terroristic and they believe that they are warriors for God and the way that they manifest that is they attack people they see as the demonic other. And so that's how, that's how this whole journey started for me. And I ended up spending about two and a half years um, infiltrating chat, white supremacist chat forums online um, and studying them. And uh, yeah, wrote my dissertation on, yeah, American white supremacy. So wait a minute. You, got to ha you have to have a really good story that is specific to your... <laughs> The time you spent infiltrating um, this group. Can, can you tell us anything about that? <laughs> um, so I visited the church in Laporte. Um, do you didn't allow me to do that as part of my dissertation work? They wouldn't approve me actually doing in-person site work. But I was like, I can't not go see this place. Mm. And so... Um, I mean, it, and it looks like a, it looks like a little white church, like you would find just in the middle of any small town America. And um, so I went up and did like recon for a couple of weekends. I wanted to see like how many people were showing up for Sunday service and what they looked like. And what I found out is that, um, well, so they have this little tiny parking lot. And the first Sunday that I was there, uh, no one was arriving in cars. They were all walking up. I was like, do they all live here? Like <laughs> within walking distance? And so, um, and I was sitting in my car trying to be very inconspicuous. Um, and, but they were all walking up and I found out later. Um, so I gave myself a screen name and I would message them back and forth. And so I asked them, um, I was like, aren't you, I, I forget exactly what I said, but I was sort of like, well, aren't you worried about, um, you know, people spying on you or something? And the response was like, oh yeah, we're totally being watched by the FBI. We park in the surrounding communities and we walk into the church so that no one can get our license plates. I was like, okay. <laughs> wow. So that's why everyone was walking up to the church and not driving. Um, so you, most of, most of your dissertation work was done here in Colorado. Um, is there anything that we would, we would miss if we weren't looking for it that speaks to white supremacy so that I me, mean, all of us who live here in Colorado and live, uh, I live in Boulder, Michelle and I live in Boulder. You live between here and Fort Collins where, where, where that church was. Is there something that we would see? on a daily or on a frequent basis that we would not otherwise recognize as white supremacists? Um, quite possibly. <laughs> I, um, you that. I, threw you, I threw that to you because I'm so interested in, in the way so, it works here around us and uh, rather than the microaggressions that we all throw at each other all the time. Right. I wonder if there's something we would see. And I say that there was the banner over I-70 for, I think it was, was it Europa? Yeah, um, Identity Europa, who has since changed their name. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, yeah, um, white, so, so from a sociological perspective, all humans give one another signs um, using symbols to indicate our, um, our affiliation with a particular group. And so, and we all do that. And so Christians might wear a cross, um, people wear sports regalia. Like th we have these ways of being like, these are my people, right? iPhone users versus Android users, you know, whatever <laughs> the thing is. So white supremacists have all kinds of those symbols. Um, and so, and they're hidden everywhere. And as soon as one of the symbols is identified by the media um, or by a professor or by law enforcement or whomever, they'll switch the symbol. And so they're constantly changing. But one, some of the common ones um, is they really like to hide Nazi symbolism in seemingly innocuous looking um, you know, visual imagery. Um, one of them is 8-8, um, uh, 88. And so, eight, so H 
is the eighth letter of the alphabet and eight eight it is h h which stands for heil hitler uh, so they do stuff like that mm. um all the time certain colors certain clothing brands new balance tennis shoes uh is one yeah that they really like um certain colors um of very specific items of clothing um yeah they do that all the time and it's like this whole hidden coded message to demonstrate that like you're part of the part of the group well i have shoes i gotta throw away now yeah I know. <laughs> so so let so let's step back a minute what, what is white supremacy how do you define it and how do you know when we see it? You've mentioned some symbols, but talk to us generally about it. Um, so at the most basic level, um, white supremacy is the belief first that race exists as an important biological category. Race is not particularly an important biological category as any good biologist will tell you, but it's the belief that it is. And that second, um, that white skinned people are intellectually and even spiritually superior to people of color. So that's sort of the broad understanding of white supremacy. Um, and we, sometimes we talk about active white supremacists and what we mean by that are the ones who are out there joining groups, attending these churches, uh, marching, demonstrating, committing hate crimes spreading pop propaganda, like actively trying to affect white supremacy. So, and they're, I mean, once you figure out what their codes are, they're pretty easy to spot. But what's more difficult um, about white supremacy is that it's also uh, unconscious bigotry that lives in the minds of a lot of people. And so, those of us who do this work often speak about implicit bias. And I would argue that that's really where racism lives and white supremacist beliefs live. And so implicit bias is an, is an unconscious belief that we've internalized from our culture. So simply by living in this culture, all of us, uh, not just white people, but all of us have internalized these ideas that um, black people, for example, are, um, are violent, are drug users, are in gangs, are welfare queens, are thugs. <laughs> and so we internalize that. And even if we are consciously resisting it, we still internalize it. And so uh, many of you probably saw the video from just last month where a woman named Amy Cooper was in Central Park and her dog was off leash and Christian Cooper, no relation, they're both last names Cooper, but no relation, uh, basically called her on having her dog off leash and she flipped out. And if you watch the video, she's calling 911. She, say, she says that her life is in danger and that she's being threatened by an African-American man who clearly from the video, which he's taking, he's way away from her. He's not near her at all. And so I would argue that in all likelihood, I don't know Amy Cooper, but I would hypothesize that that is what implicit bias looks like. She doesn't understand herself as a racist. And yet when she's put in a stressful situation, her reaction is so off the charts, irrational. Whereas if he had been a white man, in all likelihood, she still may have been angry and yelled at him and whatever, but she wouldn't have had that like, my life is in danger, like that fight or flight that was just triggered in her. That is implicit bias. And I would say that that's where a lot of white supremacy lives is in those unconscious biases that a lot of us have in our heads. Yeah. So I could say a lot more about that, but I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably get back to it when we get to it. Yeah. Um, so unpack for us a couple of things. One, how does white supremacy play a role in culture? And how, tell us how religion plays a role in racism. Sure. Um, okay, so let me talk about culture. And obviously that example of, um, Amy Cooper and Christian Cooper is an example of, of that. But I, I think what I want to talk about here is this idea of systemic racism or systemic white supremacy. Um, we hear this term a lot and, it, and it's hard to get our minds around 
So I would say though that systemic racism is implicit bias that is being actualized in practice. And I can, let me just give you some examples. I'm sorry, I'm a data person, so I love uh, data. <laughs> um, and so for example, 30% um, of people who are killed by, by police in this country are black, which means that 70% aren't black. And so a lot of people are like, oh, well, that seems about right. Black people are only 13% of the population. So they are grossly overrepresented in the numbers that are killed by police. Um, and so um, people of color are 40 to 50% of the population, but they're over 60% of those who are incarcerated. And a black man who's accused of murdering a white person, particularly a white woman, is like 200 times more likely to get a maximum sentence and the death penalty if they happen to be in a um, death penalty state. And so here's, here's another, here's a specific example. So we often um, rightly um, recognize that we in this country have a problem convicting rapists. Well, not if they're black. And so if they're black, particularly if their victim is not black, we throw the book at them. And so the best example of this is Brock Turner did three months for raping an unconscious woman. But Corey Beatty, who is a black man who is convicted of virtually the same crime, was given a minimum of 15 years, a maximum of 25 years. Brock Turner did three months. Both of these are affluent young men attending Ivy League universities as athletes, and yet vastly disparate <laughs> uh, punishments. And I'm not suggesting that you know we shouldn't be punishing rapists because obviously we should, but equitably, right? <laughs> and that's a terrible crime. They should all be facing these terrible penalties. And so these are examples from the judicial system, but let me give you an example from healthcare. So black women are two to six times more likely to die during childbirth in the United States than white women. And what's most amazing about this study that was released last year is this is true across economic classes. In other words, upper class black women who have good health insurance are dying in childbirth at rates comparable only to the developing world. These are wealthy white black women who have health care, and yet they die at astronomically higher rates. And so <laughs> these are examples of when we talk about a white supremacist culture or we talk about systemic racism, these are the types of, of, of symptoms that we see of white supremacy that's been embedded in culture. Okay, um, you also asked me about religion, right? Yeah. <laughs> how religion plays, how, I mean, we're, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a religious guy. So help me understand how my life and the, thing, and the things that I do and the work that I am involved in, how are we playing a role in racism? Sure. And you can be as honest and as direct as you would like to be. Um, in fact, I would prefer it if you did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so let Christianity invented race. Um, prior to about the 15th century, race didn't exist at, uh, as a category the way that it does now. And so if you read, um, I don't know, journals and diaries and stuff like that, descriptions of people prior to the 15th century, you do get skin color noted, <laughs> um, but it's noted in the same way as someone would say that I am a blue-eyed woman. And so you would get like, a description of a person who said, you know, his skin was very dark or something like that. And so instead of saying like that person is a black man, we get descriptions that say the man had black skin. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. So then 15th century colonialism starts as, um, a, as a economic project. And so during colonial expansion, conquistadors, explorers, and businessmen needed a justification to first disenfranchise and then enslave people and also eradicate them. And they used the Bible for that justification because in certain interpretations of the Bible, slavery is all over the place. And so the two main passages that they were used, and there's ample historic record of this, 
is Genesis chapter 9, 18 through 27, and Ephesians 4, verses 5 through 7. And so the Genesis story um, is the story of Noah and his son Ham, um, which I won't go into the details of the story. Um, the relevant passage reads, and Noah said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge uh, Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So this particular um, translation uses the word servant. Some other translations actually use the word slave. Um, the Ephesians verse reads, servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, etc. And so these were the two main verses that were used um, to justify slavery. But the most important thing is that there's a racialized way to read the Bible in that many passages use light and dark as symbolic of good and evil. And so early Christian racists made this very explicit. Lightness or whiteness indicates purity, goodness being clean in the eyes of God. And darkness is sin, it's the demonic, it's the evil. And so therefore, it was a very easy leap to say people with dark skin are those who are mentioned as cursed in the Bible, and therefore, we can enslave them because they are damned in the eyes of God. And so Christianity invented race, and it did so with a specific racist agenda. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I um, yeah, but I hear you. Um, and agree, and we got to work through that. Yeah, um, we need help working through that. I'll say that. Um, so, how about right now? Um, how is the religion? How are we Christians? Um, what are we doing presently um, to perpetuate racism? So, <laughs> I think the big thing that white people do is that we continue to argue that racism doesn't exist. And when we do that, what we're doing is we're ignoring all of the people of color who are saying that it does. Mm -hmm. And so I was just reading earlier this week um, a study by the Pew Forum that was looking at, um, at questions of racism. And I think 36% of white Americans argue that racism is a problem in the United States. When you ask people of color the same question, it's like over 70% say that racism is a problem in the United States. And so when white people say, well, white supremacy, you know, isn't, doesn't exist or isn't a big deal, what we're doing is we're ignoring all of the people of color, which is white supremacy. <laughs> and so if we are want to be not white supremacists, we have to take what they're saying seriously. We have to believe them. We have to recognize their experiences as being legitimate. And so all white people benefit from white supremacy. And that's the other thing that we need to acknowledge. Whether we know it or not, we benefit from white supremacy. And so like, I'm the product of two college educated people who could afford to go to college because even middle-class white people have enough accumulated wealth to attend college. My dad, who was uh, poor, <laughs> uh, white, Southern, uh, had to work his way through college, but he could do that because he could get good jobs and his whiteness allowed him access to higher paying jobs that weren't available to black people uh, in Mississippi. And then I also had a ton of financial aid, but I'm also considered a good investment because my, co my parents are college educated. And furthermore, because they have accumulated wealth, I didn't have to drop out of high school or go to work right after high school. I didn't have to financially contribute to the family. I could get busy starting my own life and accumulating my own wealth. And so I'm absolutely a beneficiary of white supremacy. And I haven't even gone into the fact that um, both sides of my family own slaves at different points in time, which means I'm that accumulated wealth that has been passed down intergenerationally is, is 
benefiting me immediately. And so um, that's the other thing is we have to be honest about that. We have to recognize that white people benefit from white supremacy, even if we face other challenges in, your, in our lives. But the most, a more subtle point is that I don't have the trauma of being the target of racism. Not to say that I haven't had traumas in my life, but I don't have that trauma. And we're starting to learn more and more about inherited trauma that we inherit from our ancestors. And people of color in the United States have generations of trauma that is compounded by little acts, which we call you know, microaggressions or big acts, hate crimes, of racism that they face you know, throughout their lives. Um, and so racism is not one of the challenges that white people face. And so we have it easier and we don't have the constant psychological burden of facing a world that sees us as thugs or doubts our intellectual capacity or our educational achievements, questions our experiences, belittles our calls for reform. We don't face that. And so um, as individuals, white people all benefit from white supremacy. So your, your point about uh, the, the inherited trauma, I think I read a, um, recently the term is weathering the emotional baggage of racism that black and brown people carry um, in, in our culture. I'm gonna ask you a really, in a minute, I'm gonna ask you a really pointed question about what the church needs to do. Yep. <laughs> um, and you sort of already told us how we're all um, participating in white supremacy. Um, what can we religious people specifically do to combat white, combat white supremacy? Um, I mean, the first thing is that we all need to educate ourselves. Um, and I know everybody says that, um, but we do. We need to educate ourselves about how we personally have benefited from white supremacy, but also um, what white supremacist systems are in place in the institutions that we partake in. And most importantly, we can't ask people of color to educate our, us. Please don't ever do that because they're busy trying to survive in a white supremacist society. And so it's our responsibility to educate ourselves. And so um, let, me, let me talk specifically about religion. And so, or well, Christianity specifically. We have to deeply embrace and acknowledge that Jesus was not a white man. What? <laughs> you know, he wasn't, I swear. Um, I, uh, in graduate school, I took this fantastic class called Screening Scripture, and we watched a whole bunch, I forget how many, 10 <laughs> um, films that were the Jesus story, right? And okay. so, um, yeah, talk about white Jesuses, holy moly. <laughs> Blue eyes, blonde hair, white skin. I mean, sometimes some dark hair, but still white. <laughs> and so he, Jesus was a brown man from a brown country. And so one of the things that really makes, it seems really simple, but it really makes a difference is the way that Jesus is visually depicted in churches needs to reflect that he was brown. And so the most um, ubiquitous image of Jesus in American churches is that 1940s um, painting by, I think his name is Walter Salmon. And he has sort of light brown hair. I think he does have brown eyes, very white skin, aquiline nose, and he's sort of gazing up, you know, with a halo, it's sort of like a, from the shoulders up. We've all seen that image. That's the most commonly used image of Jesus in, in the United States. That's got to go. <laughs> we have to stop that. And so we need to ask our churches that we have accurate representations of what Jesus looked like. And then the other thing is that religious people need to really and deeply grapple with the problematic passages in the Bible. Um, the Bible doesn't only have racism stuff in it. It also has really horrific misogyny. <laughs> um, and I would encourage all religious people to delve into the history of how their religion developed. And so, of course, the Bible was canonized, which means that a whole bunch of stuff was left out. Why was that stuff left out? I would say that some of it 
was left out for pretty good reason, but some of it was left out for very political reasons. And so why were those decisions made? So the best, um, I'm gonna drop a name on you here. So um, Elaine Pagels is a biblical scholar. She teaches at Princeton. Uh, she wrote this really famous book called The Gnostic Gospels, um, which was her most famous um, book. But she's written a whole bunch of others too. She's a biblical scholar. She's been doing this since the 1970s. And um, start with her. She writes for a popular audience. So um, she's very readable <laughs> too. Um, and the Gnostic Gospels will just, every, I would say every single Christian needs to read that book. So those are a couple of very practical recommendations um, that I would start with. Okay, let me ask you this pointedly then, apart from how we represent Jesus, um, I'll just ask you yes or no. You think the church needs to reform? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And not so just not with just the way we, but... Not just the way we depict Jesus, but in how we speak about others and being honest about scripture and some real serious scholarship um, around scripture and how it's damaged people in the past. I mean, as a guy who preaches every week, that's kind of what I, I'm trying to do, not always successfully. Um, what can other people do um, in their workplaces? What's an action step or um, just generally speaking, church or not church, what would you say? Um. I mean, this is a hard one, and it's something that I've been grappling with in my own personal life, <laughs> um, because I was just reading this really fantastic article last week that was making the argument that um, white people <laughs> need to stop putting all of their energy into trying to make their racist uncle less racist. That's not where our energy is needed. And I was like, huh, because part of me is like white people because we have a privileged platform, people listen to white people in a way that they don't listen to people of color. And so we can say the exact same thing that a person of color has just said, but people will listen to us and hear us in a way that they won't listen to that person of color. And so part of it is that we need to just constantly push back against racism whenever we encounter it. But we have to learn to recognize it because that's part of what white privilege does. Um, the sociologist Michael Kimmel says that privilege is a form of blindness. And so what privilege is, is not having to think about race. So we don't know how to recognize racism because we've never had to think about it. So we have to educate ourselves and learn to see it. And trust me, once you learn to see it, it's everywhere. <laughs> um, it'll never be the same. And then we need to push back against that. Ideally, by when possible, elevating voices of color. Um, and so like one of the things that I'll do is when I hear you know, something that's racist, um, I will often say, um, well, were you aware that Maya Angelou said, <laughs> and so, you know, like I try to call upon these scholars of color and attribute that, but use those, right? And so we, and that's all part of being educated so that we have those things in our back pocket. But the other thing that people, have, that white people really need to do is we need to support people of color in doing this work. And we can do that by donating money, by donating our time, um, by just like, <laughs> So um, every year for the last, oh, I don't know, 10 years, my uh, mother-in-law likes to read. So every book I've given her has been written by an author of color. I've never said anything about it. And I give her books in the genre she likes to read, <laughs> but they're all by people of color. <laughs> uh, so if we want to get started as, as, as a white people, as privileged people, as a privileged church, um, as people who swim freely in a world of whiteness and privilege, 
where would you tell us to start with a resource or a pike, anything that you would recommend to us? Um, so I think one of the most interesting places or interesting resources out there are um, churches that serve uh, communities of color. And so they're out there giving sermons. They're out there interpreting the Bible. How are they doing it? And how can white churches bring that into their own work? And so, um, I mean, I, I, I gave it to you pretty hard when, you know, we talked about where racism came from and it came from Christians. But here's the good news. The words of Jesus... I'm not going to talk about Paul. Don't even get me started. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> was a liberator. And when we think about, so when African slaves were brought to the United States, they were forced to convert to Christianity. But then what they did was they were like, well, okay, so here we are. May as well make the best of it. And they actually started looking at the Bible and what they found was a liberator. Mm. And so black Christianity is built on that message about tearing down systems of oppression and liberating the people. And so in, look to what those black churches have done. Um, coming out of Mexico, but now infiltrating all types of Spanish speaking congregations is the idea of liberation theology. It's a whole thing that is built specifically on the liberation message of Christianity. And so white churches, you don't have to invent it yourself. The work has already been done and it's been done by people of color. And so tapping into that as a resource, I think is a great place to start. Awesome. Um, so I read, I read, I'm reading a preaching book about African-American preaching right now, um, which I love, but, but the author says that um, we, the white churches have, have a, a, a preoccupation with personal salvation um, and it's not something that the black churches really even yeah. talk, talk much about. So before we open it up to questions, would, what, what, is there anything that I didn't get to that you would want to say to us? Um, I think the only other thing that I would really say is that um, Christians are actually uniquely positioned to combat race, the racism of American Christianity. Um, in some way, like a non-Christian, like I can only say so much and be believe for so long. And so in the same way that white people need to do the work of talking to other white people, Christians need to do the work of talking to other Christians. And so if you're in that community and speaking that language, you have access to communities that non-Christians don't have. And so um, that's the only other thing I would, I, I would say. Um, you have this wealth of examples of biblical figures who rise up and overthrow tyranny. And so learning to talk in that language and educating other Christians who will listen to you um, is the only other thing I would add. Uh, that sounds like a commission. <laughs> Go get them. <laughs> Go get them. Um, so if it's okay with you, we're gonna turn to some questions. Great. Uh, and and move through. Uh, our producer Michelle is going to um, give us some questions. Are you ready, Michelle? I've texted them to you and Catlin. Do you want me to start with one of them? Um, yeah, I did not receive. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Do something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see. This is from Darren. Um, as a black man, I may not ever ever be the direct victim of a macroaggression, but I have been in, I have endured countless microaggressions. I think we use these terms, I think the use of these terms can send the wrong signal to whites that all, that all aggressions based on race are traumatic. And the categorizing these aggressions tend to minimize the effects of those that we deem micro in nature. Can, can you speak to that? Cool. Oh. I mean, I'm not sure I could have said it better. <laughs> if you, I mean, what's, what is, um, what is a microaggression? Uh, sure. So microaggressions are usually unconscious and unintended. 
Um, uh, the best thing to do is let me give you an example of one. Okay. So um, imagine for a moment that I am not this white, blue eyed person, but that I am um, Chinese. Okay. So let's say that we meet for the first time and you say, where are you from? And I say, Longmont, Colorado. And you say, no, originally. Ooh. That's a micro, uh, right? A microaggression. And so <laughs> here's the thing. Like your intention is to try to get to know me, which is great. But imagine that everyone I meet asks me that. And so cumulatively over decades, people ask me that same question again and again and again and again. And so that's how something, like if it was a single isolated incident, I could walk away and be like, ugh, idiot, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> fine. But after the 75th time, it's, it's an accumulated message to me that I don't belong, that I'm not from here. And that when I say I'm from Longmont, Colorado, you don't believe me. And so that's how microaggressions can start as these little tiny isolated incidents. But um, what it, um, I heard somebody recently called microaggressions death by a thousand cuts, paper cuts. Mm -hmm. So each one is a paper cut and a thousand later, you're really hurting. So I don't know if that illuminates anything, but. Well, it sounds like repeated small traumas just build up and build up and build up and yeah exactly, um, exactly. so another question um oh i love this one how do you deal with churches and people who say keep politics out of church when you try to talk about race and or racism or white privilege uh the question says i keep hearing this at my church and it's very disappointing because to me you cannot separate it as thomas merton and gandhi and many others have stated what do you, what do you say about that? I think that's a question for you, Alan. <laughs> uh, I don't, <laughs> I would say that, that if we say that we haven't read our Bible and we don't know about Jesus and we, yes. we think Jesus came to, to, to transform hearts, but he also came to transform societies. I mean, yes. he was speaking out against an empire. So I, I would say that just to even say that I would like to keep those two things separate is a cop out and only people of privilege can say that. Absolutely. That's absolutely what I would say as well. Um, and what we really, we really have to combat this idea that politics is separate from the rest of our lives. Everything is political, mm -hmm. right? And so using Jesus's message against tyranny is an excellent way to, to respond mm -hmm. to those types of comments. <laughs> I like to use the prophets, man. They're all over that social, that social change thing. Um, okay, so another question, a comment, and then a, and then a question, I guess. Um, it feels like we've tried to dialogue. We've tried dialogue and politeness to address racism for decades. How do you feel about calling out, um, read that, shaming a white community versus being gentle and having them slowly realize what needs to change? Uh, feels like the latter is very privileged is a privileged path when black, brown, and indigenous bodies are literally dying from white supremacy. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, that actually drives me completely crazy. Like, well, give it time. We have. We've given it so much time. Right. And so, um, I would I I would say sometimes we need to be called out. And if you want to say sometimes we need to feel shame, as long as that's a catalyst for change, um, that, I mean, I'm to the point now where I'm just really starting to respond, not aggressively, but just by saying, you know, like, look, I'm sorry, but I really don't have time to deal with your feelings about this. I need to get back to the work that I'm trying to do. <laughs> um, and so white guilt is understandable um and in some way like it's good it's a good sign that some white people feel guilty but ultimately that's completely not productive and 
it's a way for white people to turn the conversation back to themselves again. Well, I'm ashamed. Well, I feel guilty. Great, we're talking about white people again. <laughs> Man. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so I, I, you just reminded me of of a quote uh, of an interview with James Baldwin. Uh, he 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 asked the question, "How much time do you white people need for your progress?" Yes. Uh, I mean, it's it's yes. a question worth thinking about. Um, I, I will say that being combative uh, sometimes you get dismissed if you're combative. But that's, that's, that's supremacy in itself. That's language supremacy. You know, you, we'll listen to you when you say it the way we want you to say it. Right. So, I mean, that, that's a hard thing to negotiate as well. Um, well, I think about it. Jesus got really mad at a couple of points. Like, oh, yeah. It's okay to be angry. So something should make us angry. <laughs> so another question. Um, if a person brings up violence against bl uh, the black community, in a mostly white chat thread where people are having lighthearted conversation. And the response is that this is the wrong forum for politics. What might you say to that? Um, gosh. I mean, I think I would, I would say that everything is political and that, I mean, here's the thing. <laughs> Um, this is going to sound a little weird, um, but we can actually talk about race and racism and white supremacy and misogyny and sexual assault and all of the really bad things in a way that is not completely doom and gloom, that is in fact uplifting and liberating. Because acknowledging something then empowers us to do something about it. And here's the other thing. <laughs> I'm a big believer in the power of the positive power of humor mm -hmm. and so we're not and we're not talking about racist jokes here but if somebody says you know oh this isn't a place for politics my response is always going to be everything is political and we need to be talking about this and if you're in a position where you can move away from this that just demonstrates that you're privileged enough to be able to escape it mm. um so you tell me, tell, I'm sure you watch a lot of movies and television and in a research kind of way. Um, <laughs> how, much, how much does TV and how much do TV and movies propagate implicit bias? Oh my God. So much. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, if you looked at, um, look at the, um, picture, the films that were nominated for Best Picture, not even the winners, but the ones that were nominated for Best Picture since the beginning of the Oscars. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of them are pictures about white men. Mm. And so the lack of representation is implicit bias. It's the assumption that stories about people of color are that put people of color for, in the forefront or women in the forefront aren't money makers that people don't want to see those that they won't make a profit that is implicit bias and so representation i would say is hugely important and i will say that even in the last five years i've seen some really good signs that this is starting to crumble now, um, there, were, there have been some very important films and television shows featuring actors of color, featuring women in prominent roles that have done very well and been very commercially successful. And what that does is it shows the producers of these, um, of the, these media that these stories actually will make money. Mm -hmm. And so we still have a hugely enormous long way to go. <laughs> Um, so we can't say, well, you know, we had Black Panther, so we're all woke now, job done. We can't do that. <laughs> but what we can do is we can um, support these media um, so that it continues to move in the right direction. I see some signs that it is moving in the right direction. I, so just, just briefly um, and anecdotally, I, I went back and watched a movie, one of my favorite movies from the 80s. Um, uh, uh, John Hughes movie and yeah. oh my god it was like totally 
I mean, it was racist. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe yeah. I, mean, I never thought anything about it until yeah. recently. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, you know, there's a lot of work to be done for those of us who grew up on seemingly innocuous messages. Um, but just, what a good sign, though, that number one, you recognize it. And in all likelihood, if you showed a 20 year old that movie, they would immediately see it too. Oh, yeah. So that really demonstrates the type of progress that I'm hope, hopeful about. Okay, so I'm going to, you, you, you've been talking about white supremacy. Um, and I know you know something about this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask it for you, even though you, you, you might not have been expecting it. Um, <laughs> Can you say something about um, anti-Semitism in the church, in the Christian church? Oof, yeah. Um, I could, wow, that's a whole other talk. Okay, um, yes. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I would argue that there are points of intersection between anti-Semitism and racism because um, Jewish people have often been categorized as not white. Mm. And so, um, and it was part of this racialized um, project that started in, um, in the colonial period. And so, um, who is understood as white is also, it shifts all over the place over time. And so, like, my favorite example of this is actually not an American one. It's from South Africa during apartheid. So I think it was the Japanese, Japanese, um, I should know this, um, came into South Africa as investors. They wanted to invest in certain um, local resources, but it was an apartheid system. And so the white people who were in charge were like, uh, wait a minute, um, well, how do we classify these Asians? So they can't be black because then they have to be disenfranchised and we can't do business with them. But obviously they're not white. Yeah, they are. We'll just make them white. They're white now. <laughs> so you actually get a legal definition. Um, and so the same thing happens throughout history with Jewish people, depending on the political motives of whatever country or state you're talking about. And so really what Christianity, what Roman Catholicism, tries to do is it tries to set itself up without any other competitors. And the fact that Judaism shares many of the books of what Christians call the Old Testament is a real threat to Catholicism. And they use a lot of the same techniques that are later used against people of color to disenfranchise the Jews. And then once race has been invented, they have a really easy out. They can just be like, oh, well, Jews aren't white. So huge overlap. Wow. So I'm on uh, uh, our producer, Michelle. Um, she's going to unmute somebody that you know. Um, hey, Hannah, are you there? I am. Uh, Hi, Hannah. Hey. <laughs> Go ahead, Hannah. Alan. Yeah, so this is fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and I, you know, I, um, so I grew up Unitarian and haven't been connected to church for a while, but I know a big component of, of going to church and, or it, at least it was for me was, and I think some people in my family was about being good. Like you do this to have, this is how you're showing that you're being good or you're learning these values and these things to be good. And that, very much contradicts with the idea or I mean with with racism and the racism that happens you know throughout and I was just wondering if you could comment on that idea of the uh, getting engaged in something to be a good person and still being um, racist or having those the implicit bias and the racist thoughts and things like that. That's a great question, Hannah. Oh, man. Um, I mean, my, my first thought here is that I think you've actually hit on something that's yet another way that we as individuals, but also Christians, can move forward in productive ways. Because what we need to do is we need to have a conversation about what it means to be good. And so if, and there's lots of material 
some of which needs to be critically analyzed, but some of which can be drawn upon from ins for inspiration from the Bible. And being good, the whole, one of the main premises of much of Christianity is that being good is hard work. Let's do the hard work. <laughs> and so part of that hard work is to uh, interrogate our own traditions and have real meaningful conversations about what it is to be good and what it means to have compassion and not just give it lip service, but actually act in compassionate, loving ways, which are by definition, not racist. That's what I mean. That's my first thought. Yeah. I could think a lot more about that. Thank you. Hey, hey, can, Hannah, can I respond to that for a second? Yeah, As I would love it. A guy that works with um, good Christians all the time. Um, <laughs> Whenever about somebody tells me when the first thing out of their mouth is I'm a good Christian, it makes me want to first throw up and then run. Um, because that tells me, I mean, why do we have to always insinuate our goodness um, in, into a conversation? I don't get it. Anyway, sorry. I didn't mean to take your time. <laughs> no, that's, that's a great insight. So if there, um, what if you want to leave us with with one thing what what would you what would you say to us just tell tell us tell us anything that you would tell a student in one of your classes or um just leave us i mean Howard Thurman was a guy who was all about hope <laughs> um what what can you what would you leave us with um I would say that the most important thing for me in continuing to do this work is that um, I have to be forgiving and gentle with myself. So I have been raised in a white supremacist culture. I have a ton of white privilege and there, and which gives me a platform and the energy to dedicate to this work, which is of course good things, but I get it wrong. Uh, I, I do, and um, I find a microaggression popping out of my mouth, or I find myself, you know, watching a television show that features a person of color, and, you know, having one of those thoughts about, like, well, how did they get cast on this show, you know, and then I'm like, oh my god, there it is, and so I think that we have to be, white people have to hold ourselves accountable and practice forgiveness when we get it wrong, because we are going to get it wrong. And in those moments, we have to be forgiving with ourselves and we have to just always fall back to a position of elevating the needs of the disenfranchised mm. and using our platform to do that. So sort of two sides of the same coin is how I see those things. But yeah, cut yourself some slack and own it. If you screw up, own it. Be like, oh my God, privileged white person moment. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Catlin Keenan. Catlin, thank you so much for joining us. You're our first guest uh, in the series. So thank you for getting us started off on, on a good foot. Um, you guys can, uh, we're going to put in the chat, or Michelle's going to put in the chat again, Catlin's web address, catlinkeenan.com. You can find her book anywhere, Strip the Making of a Feminist, which is fabulous. Um, I want to thank a couple of folks. Um, I want to thank Michelle, particularly um, Michelle Auerbach-Cole. She is producing our series. It's, it's her hard work with the Race Task Force. She's the one who's putting all this together and letting me do the awesome work of interviewing people, which is really fun. Um, we'll have another one. We'll, we'll be back uh, on, on, on July the 2nd. Um, so please, if you're, if you're here, that means we have your email address. We'll send an email out to you to tell you, uh, or give you a, a Zoom link to our next um, meeting, our, ne our next interview. Um, thank you so much for all of you who are listening for joining us tonight. Um, I hope, hope you learned something. And we have, uh, Callan's given us some things to do, um, ending with being gentle and forgiving. Catlin, thank you so much. Um, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, everyone. See you.